Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly, your weekly dose of the top pro-life news and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Katherine Seltner in our Washington, D.C. studio. It is truly good to have you here with us. The fight to defund Planned Parenthood continues, not only at the federal level, but at the state levels as well. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton is urging a federal appeals court to overturn an order halting the state from cutting Medicaid dollars to Planned Parenthood. Paxton accuses the abortion giant of breaches of medical and ethical standards based on the undercover Planned Parenthood videos. The videos claim to show the nation's largest abortion provider profiting from sales of aborted baby tissue for medical research. Last December, Texas's Health and Human Services Inspector General removed Planned Parenthood from the state's Medicaid program. Planned Parenthood receives over $3 million in state Medicaid funding annually. Joining us now is Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton. Thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Attorney General, you are accusing Planned Parenthood of breaches of medical and ethical standards. Can you specify what you mean by that claim? Yeah, it's pretty unusual that the state of Texas would go to this length to defund uh, something like a, a provider like this, but because of what you're talking about, the violation of both medical and ethical standards, we're in the process of doing that. We're doing it because we have doctors who are performing abortions, but they're also doing research on fetal tissue, which is uh, unethical and, and probably a violation of law. Um, we have uh, Planned Parenthood. We know that they, they lied to the Texas Rangers when they were dealing with uh, talking about their study with uh, Baylor Medicine. And we also know that they've changed procedures in doing abortions to make themselves, uh, allow themselves to get better fetal tissue to do their, their, to do their research. And so all of those are issues that we're concerned about. All of those are issues that we believe are at least ethically wrong and, and, and potentially, you know, there may be a violation of law. So that's why the state of Texas is interested in this and that's why we're focused on ending their Medicaid funding. Those breaches that you mentioned would be based on those undercover Planned Parenthood videos. So what do you say to people who claim the undercover videos are heavily edited and therefore can't prove any wrongdoing from Planned Parenthood? Well, I disagree with them. This is one of the very first times, it may be the first time that we've actually had video footage that we're going to be able to use in court. So this is uh, important evidence. Uh, you know, if they can show that they were somehow changed and altered, good for them. But I don't think they're going to find that that is true. I think ultimately we're going to be successful because we do have that footage of exactly what they said and what they meant to do. What kind of difference, Attorney General, are you hoping to make by blocking Medicaid funding from going to Planned Parenthood? How significant are Medicaid dollars to this abortion giant? Well, it's millions of dollars, so it has a, it's going to have a dramatic impact. And obviously our, our goal here is to stop providers from, from doing this type of, of activity where they're, they're operating in violation of both ethical and potentially legal standards. So, you know, we have a significant interest in this because these are our dollars, these are taxpayer dollars going to fund this. And given what we know from these films, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a travesty what's going on. How has defunding Planned Parenthood impacted women's health in your state so far? Has there been a health crisis? No, that's just inaccurate. Of course, that's a narrative you're going to hear from the other side, but the reality is all of the major metropolitan markets still have providers that are doing abortions. And so the reality is it hasn't, it hasn't really affected access at all. And so that's just a false narrative that, that, that is being pushed by the other side. Ultimately, this isn't about that. This is about are they acting unethically and in violation of law. Do you believe, Attorney General, this is something a majority of Texans want to see happen? What role do states' rights play in the greater pro-life battle? Well, look, this is our money. This is taxpayer dollars. You know, people have trouble funding this stuff anyway, but particularly if they're going to violate ethical and medical standards. And look, people can decide for themselves as they watch these, these videos. They're going to see the truth. It's hard to hide the truth when it's on film and in front of the world to see. Texas really is leading the nation in defunding Planned Parenthood. What do you want to say to other state attorney generals considering similar action? And are you hoping to see any action taken by U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions? Look, I think other states should consider this if they find that they have evidence of something similar. We certainly were fortunate to get these tapes. Um, so if these tapes exist for other states, I, I think they ought, to, they ought to consider doing the same thing we're doing. 
And ultimately, you know, I, I don't have much control over what happens at the federal level, but I certainly think the federal, federal people should look at this, including Jeff Sessions. We got some of our information from a House Select Committee that, that provided some of this information. And so we know that, that, that some of this information is available to, to the federal government as well. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, thank you for your time. Hey, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it on this important topic. To continue this discussion, we are joined in our D.C. studio by this week's expert panel. Dr. Michael New is an associate scholar with the Charlotte Lozier Institute, and Jeannie Mancini is president of the March for Life. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Jeannie, first off, I want to get your reaction to what we just heard Ken Paxton tell us. Right. Well, I mean, I'm just so grateful for the Attorney General and what they're doing in Texas. Um, he mentioned the report, of course, um, about, you know, the Center for Medical Progress's videos. And, you know, it's been proven by at least one forensic analysis that I'm aware of, Coal Fire, which is a really mainstream group um, that does a lot of this kind of work. And they showed that those videos were not manipulated. They were not spliced. Um, they were not cut in any kind of way, shape, or form. So it's unfortunate that Planned Parenthood keeps repeating that talking point, but it's, it's totally erroneous. Michael, what do you make of the strategy of how Texas is defunding Planned Parenthood? I think pro-lifers should really appreciate and applaud the work that Texas is doing. Uh, since the early 1990s, the pro-life movement's really placed a lot of emphasis on doing more things at the state level. Hmm. That's paid, paid a lot of dividends. We've seen more states pass parental involvement laws, more states pass informed consent laws, uh, more states banning abortion after 20 weeks. Uh, since the early 90s, number of abortions have been fallen by about 25 percent, and that state-level strategy is an important reason why. Michael, you're a numbers guy, an economics yeah. professor. Mm -hmm. A lot of mainstream media is saying there is a health crisis going on in Texas right now. But what do the statistics tell us? Well, the fact, the, no, the narrative that there is a uh, public health crisis is absolutely false. Uh, in some cases, media outlets have literally made things up. In other mm -hmm. cases, they've taken studies out of context. Mm -hmm. But here are the facts, and the facts are that most public health trends in Texas are very positive. Uh, Abortions are down by over 20% since 2011. Abortions performed on minors are down by over 40%. Mm. The minor birth rate's down by 20%. So again, these are all very positive public health trends that the mainstream media is just not reporting. Jeannie, we heard Ken Paxton say he hopes the federal government and Jeff Sessions does take more action when it comes to defunding Planned Parenthood. Where are we on the federal front when it comes to this? Yeah, it's a great question. So, um, you know, the House Select Committee looked at some of these uh, terrible things that we saw from the Center for Medical Progress videos where we're seeing hard, harvesting of little hearts, little lungs, little livers. It's so hard, you know, to take it all in. And, mm -hmm. and they came up with, I believe, 11 counts of, of what they thought were, were really, you know, problems. Um, and then the Senate Committee did the same, and they came up with, I think, seven counts. And so both of those went to the Department of Justice. Mm -hmm. And so the the role of the Justice Department now is to look into this. Uh, to further kind of amplify the importance of this, the March for Life, joining with other pro-life leaders, sent a letter to the Department mm -hmm. of Justice about three months ago mm -hmm. asking the Attorney General to take a look at this um, because, you know, look, it's time for Planned Parenthood to be defunded. Right. We've seen these videos. We've had these committees and these hearings. A big question on a lot of pro-lifers' lips right now. We're, it's August. We're more than 200 days into this administration. When is Planned Parenthood going to be defunded? As people who are so active in the pro-life movement, can you respond to that big major question right now? Well, the defunding of Planned Parenthood has been kind of wrapped into the broader debate about reforming health care. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a complicated issue where there's, uh, even though there's probably right. a consensus among the law of Republicans to defund Planned Parenthood, there's less of a consensus about how to reform health care. So I think that uh, the issue is still alive. Uh, it's a good chance Congress will revisit the whole health care issue sometime in the future. And pro-lifers should continue to contact congressmen and senators, let them know this is a priority, and hopefully we will see some action in the mm -hmm. near future. Mm -hmm. Jeannie? I agree. And some basic, basic points about Planned Parenthood that's so important for public opinion is, um, one, they're our nation's largest abortion provider. They do over 320,000 abortions every year, and it's horrific to realize that. Two, they're not a benevolent health care organization. They're extremely politically involved. Um, they put millions of dollars into this past election. And in fact, their current president said that she would, she wanted to make the organization the largest kick butt political organization out there and even was a surrogate for Hillary Clinton in the campaign. And then last, we can't forget 
what we're talking about here that they harvested little hearts, little lungs, little livers. They didn't get the mother's permission. They didn't, you know, they didn't do this legally. So it's it's really important that we continue to spread the word about that so that public opinion can ultimately influence our legislators as well. Absolutely. And every day that passes matters. Thank you both for being here. And please do stay here because I want to get your take on this next story also involving a pro-life Texan. The only way that we're going to root out the evil of abortion is with the truth that an innocent human being is killed. In a that was Nellie Gray, the founder of the March for Life, speaking with our network's founder, Mother Angelica. August 13th marked five years since Gray's death. We honor her in a special way this week and remember how she helped start a modest, peaceful protest against Roe v. Wade and grew it to become the largest annual human rights demonstration internationally. Jeannie, Nellie was your predecessor. You knew her. What should our viewers know about her? Well, it's, I mean, Nellie was incredible in so many ways. She was a woman of very strong character. Um, she, knew, she knew what she believed, um, and she was a selfless woman. Uh, she was a very ardent Catholic. She preferred the Latin Mass. She was a parishioner here at St. Mary's in Chinatown. Mm. Um, she quit her job as an attorney, a very, very intelligent woman. She worked for the federal government for almost 30 years quit her job to start running the March for Life with a handful of other pro-lifers the year after Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. was passed. So, I mean, truly a hero. And she was known as the Joan <laughs> of Arc in the pro-life movement, right? I've heard that term thrown around. That's right. Cardinal O'Malley has used that term, and it's it's a great, I think it describes her because she was so courageous and never backed down. She was so bold. Mm, incredible. Jeannie, what do you hope to carry on Nellie's legacy? Well, I, I, it's really only by standing on her shoulders that the March for Life is where it is today. She never anticipated that the march would become the largest annual human rights demonstration around the world. Um, so we built upon what she's done, you know, for 40 years, and we continue to grow and to try to draw in as many people um, that, you know, can just learn about the beauty and the inherent dignity of every human life. So, Michael, um, from a pro-life historical perspective, how do you think Nellie will be remembered? I think she'll be remembered very fondly by a lot of pro-lifers, and she deserves to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think pro-lifers really owe a lot of gratitude toward people who started doing pro-life work in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, including Nellie Gray, literally quit their job uh, to do pro-life work. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any obvious way to support themselves financially uh, or raise money. Uh, they really were faithful and relied on God, and uh, they're planting seeds that bear fruit to this day. So I think that Nellie Gray will be someone who's remembered very fondly for, for years to come. Absolutely. And thank you both for the work that you do, Dr. Michael New, Jeannie Mancini. Thank you. Thank you. With every day that passes without Planned Parenthood being defunded, nearly 900 unborn children are aborted, and $1.5 million in taxpayer funds are poured into the abortion giant. Members of Congress are home in their districts this week and need to hear from you, their constituents, right now. With that, we turn to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to tell Congress to defund Planned Parenthood. Once you go to ProLifeWeekly.com, just type in your first name, your last name, email address, and zip code. If you type in this basic information, your message goes straight to your member of Congress. Just because Congress is on recess doesn't mean they get a break. So if you haven't done so already, please take action now. It's important we keep up this pro-life pressure. Pro-lifers have control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, so there's no excuse. Now is the time to defund Planned Parenthood, especially as they continue to perform abortions each and every day. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell Congress to defund Planned Parenthood. Alabama's top prosecutor says the state will appeal a federal judge's ruling that struck down a one-of-a-kind pro-life law. The law could grant an attorney to an unborn child if a minor woman was seeking an abortion. Alabama has argued this process would allow for a more robust inquiry to help a judge make a decision about the minor's maturity level. Some early fetuses will die in early in pregnancy, either due to abortion or miscarriage. And in my view, that's a very different kind of entity. That's something that doesn't have a future as a person, and it doesn't have moral status. In a video gaining a lot of online attention, Princeton professor Liz Harmon argues an unborn child only has a moral status if the mother does not take the child's life. The interview is part of a Philosophy Time video series by actor James Franco. Many people online are pointing out the professor's flawed logic and that even Franco does not appear to be buying it. The Catholic Church teaches every human life from the point of conception has invaluable dignity. 
A recent study we first brought you last week reveals more than half of UK women who sought abortions last year were on contraception. Does this mean there is a contraception abortion link? And what should pro-life Catholics make of this information? Dr. John Grabowski is a moral theology and ethics professor at the Catholic University of America. He and his wife were appointed as members of the Pontifical Council for the Family in 2009. Dr. Grabowski, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Pro-lifers often hear, if you really want to bring down abortion, you should support contraception. But based on this report alone, that's obviously not true. We have heard that rhetoric from Planned Parenthood for decades. In fact, mm -hmm. if you go back to the early 20th century, Margaret Sanger mm. um, promised in her writing that if we had widespread effective contraception, we would reduce or even maybe eliminate abortion, infanticide, child neglect, and abandonment. And what this study, among others, show mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. is that the reality doesn't match that rhetoric. Would you say then there is a contraception abortion link? Obviously, mm -hmm. um, and this study is not a one-off. Mm -hmm. This study confirms what other studies have told us over the years, that contraceptive use actually drives higher rates of abortion. Why do you think that is? Um, I think there's a variety of reasons for it. I think um, clearly contraception has a failure rate, mm -hmm. and so for many people, abortion becomes the last mm -hmm. line of defense for failed contraception. Um, contraception also encourages people to risky sexual behavior, mm -hmm. especially young people mm -hmm. who wouldn't otherwise engage in sexual behavior. So for both of those reasons, contraceptive use actually seemingly increases the number of abortions. And even though the church has been very clear as to what the teaching is, there are still many Catholics who believe contraception is permissible. Can you clarify what the church teaches? The church has taught and believed since its beginning mm -hmm. that contraception is wrong, that it, it is intrinsically evil, um, that is, it's never right to engage in an act of contraception. The church has taught that throughout its history. In fact, coming into the 20th century, that was the teaching of every Christian church every major Protestant figure and teacher, Luther, Calvin, John mm. Wesley, um, taught that contraception was morally evil. The first Christian church to change that teaching was the Anglican Church in 1930 after mm. a very intensive lobbying campaign by Margaret Sanger. Wow. So this has always been the teaching of the church. The church has always taught it with great authority. Many theologians think that it the, the constancy and authority of the teaching meets the criterion for a definitive or an infallible exercise of the church's ordinary magisterium. St. John Paul II actually taught that this truth is not just a truth of reason, mm -hmm. it emerges out of scripture itself. It's a truth of biblical revelation and his theology of the body helps us understand the reasons for that. It sounds as if Sanger really targeted churches to try and change the way what they taught to confuse Christians and believers. She absolutely did. Um, and she did it very um, strategically. Mm. She certainly courted anti-Catholic sentiment mm. um, in the United States and in Great Britain, though she herself was born into a Catholic family. Wow. Um, yes, she, she engaged in a very effective lobbying campaign and drew on even quasi-Christian rhetoric in trying to make the case. Again, what she promised was a utopia. Mm -hmm. If we have widespread contraception, mm -hmm. we can do away with abortion and child neglect. Every child would be loved and wanted. And we still hear that from Planned Parenthood right. today. The Catholic Church, on the other hand, does offer and teach about natural family planning. Can you, Dr. Grabowski, uh, tell us, for those of us who may not be familiar, what NFP is and how it does differ from birth control? differs from um, contraception in almost every respect. Natural family planning refers to a group of methods of fertility awareness mm -hmm. so that a couple can be aware of their shared fertility and cooperate with it mm. rather than trying to suppress it through chemicals, through surgery, chemicals and or mechanical devices that often pose significant health risks, especially to women. Hmm. Natural family planning works with 
a couple's fertility, a woman's fertility, and enables couples to practice what the church calls responsible parenthood. That is, it can help them avoid pregnancy when they have good reason to do so. It can also help them become pregnant if they have limited fertility or are struggling with certain kinds of infertility. And that is truly empowering to women. Dr. John Grabowski of the Catholic University of America, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for allowing me to be. Absolutely. When we come back, they told us, well, we've decided to deny you official club status. We hear how a college tried to silence a pro-life club and about the pro-life student who persisted. Stay tuned as EWTN Pro-Life Weekly continues after this break. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Seltner. A group of major companies you would recognize sponsored a protest against a pro-life women's health care clinic this past weekend, and we are speaking out against it. Shut them down! Shut them down! Facebook and Google were the premier sponsors of this pro-abortion Net Roots Nation protest you're seeing right now. The annual event targeted the pro-life organization Human Coalition and the Georgia Healthcare Clinic they operate under the name Cura. Protesters claim the clinics are fake because they don't offer abortion to pregnant women. Human Coalition uses online and digital outreach to find women in crisis pregnancies. Pro-lifers, pay attention to the brands behind this protest. Facebook and Google are two of the most powerful companies in the world. The fact that they are putting dollars into pro-abortion events means we need to be even more vigilant about what causes they promote and support. We must always be aware of these companies' agendas. And it is frankly bizarre groups supposedly rallying for women's health care would call for a free women's health clinic to shut down. These are clinics offering vulnerable pregnant women support. They are walking alongside women during an unplanned pregnancy. Protesters claim Human Coalition, the pro-life organization behind the clinics, is deceitful because the clinics don't provide abortion and pregnant women who find them online might be seeking one. Here is how Human Coalition co-founder and president Brian Fisher responded to that allegation when we asked him. The process of reaching a woman with compassion and grace mm -hmm. and saving a child is a threat to the abortion industry, which mm -hmm. is entirely based on profit making, and they are responding with these sort of allegations. Remember, there is something you can do to counter today's culture of death. Follow this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com and tell Congress to defund Planned Parenthood. Public universities are supposed to be a marketplace of ideas, but what happens if those ideas are pro-life? This week, we introduce you to Norvelia Etienne, a Catholic pro-life student who faced resistance for simply wanting to start a pro-life club. Norvelia Etienne values life because she almost didn't have one. When I was 16, I found out that my mom considered having an abortion. It was a piece of her own past history that would lead to a future decision. When I found this out, the Lord started working in my heart and he started um, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he brought people in my life, my spiritual director, Catholic priest, um, and Students for Life of America came just at, the same, at that same time. Etienne decided she wanted to start a Students for Life of America club at Queens College, a public New York university. Quite honestly, all colleges need a pro-life club um, because there are pregnant women on our campuses and they do need the resources that Students for Life of America and um, the pregnancy resources have to offer. A lot of them don't know this and so they think um, when they get pregnant in, in college that their only option is, is, is to have an abortion and Planned Parenthood knows this. Norvelia, along with other Queens students, filled out the paperwork and crafted their club constitution when they ran into a roadblock with the Campus Affairs Committee. When we were proposing our, our club and why we needed it on campus, um, the people on, on, the, on the board, they asked us to stop um, talking so much about um, the statistics on how, why we needed the club there because of Planned Parenthood being so close by and, and, and our students. They asked us to stop stating the facts um, and just to state, you know, what, what do you, you want to be here for? Why do why you want to be here? Um, and I proceeded to repeat myself because <laughs> that's why we needed to be there. The students were told they would receive an answer by the end of the day. 
but they heard nothing. After a week of, of, of asking them, you know, what is your decision on this, they told us, well, we've decided to deny you official club status at Queens College. And when we peered in, when we asked, okay, why, so that we could improve our processes for next semester, at least to, to reapply, nothing. We heard nothing back, and we were kind of expecting it at that point. ATN reached out to Students for Life of America, who reached out to their lawyers, Alliance Defending Freedom. The religious liberty law firm filed suit against Queens College and the school relented on their decision. But as one of ADF's attorneys tells us, the pro-life battle isn't over yet. But the case still is going forward because they're not allowing her to have equal access to some of the student funding and really she could lose her status as a student group um, at really at any time. So we're working to fight that policy at Queens as well as on other colleges. So all students can be free to form these groups and to serve, serve women and to be able to engage others, other students in, in real good dialogue. For this college student, it's a pro-life battle still worth fighting. A person is a person no matter how small and they deserve equal treatment. That's it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. You can reach us anytime at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. I look forward to hearing from you and to seeing you here again next week. Life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.